Bippity boppity boop. Hi guys, welcome to episode three of Fairy Tales with Jen. As you know, every month or so, I take a fairy tale that we know and perhaps love or hate and talk about the history of that fairy tale, all of the gruesome stuff that Disney left out. And today, we're gonna to be talking about Cinderella. The reason that I've picked Cinderella this month is because my editor and I were having a little giggle to ourselves because according to this not very wide survey, Cinderella is the favorite fairy tale of the UK. I'll leave a link to that survey down below. And that kind of surprised us because um, Cinderella, I love, love, love the history of it and I'm looking forward to telling you about it, but the Disney version that we probably most know is not one of my favourites. Um, however, as I said, I love the history of it and I want to tell you about it. So, there are hundreds of different versions of Cinderella that stretch back throughout history and I talked about this in the previous episodes when I was talking about Hansel and Gretel and Sleeping Beauty. Fairy tales stretch back and back and back, but with regard to those, they stretch back a few hundred years mostly. Um, as a full tale, as in of themselves, um, but before that you can trace elements of the tale in other tales back in history because that's what fairy tales are, they're snowballs that have been collected over time, oral traditions where things have been passed, picked and mushed together in this glorious, horrible story. Um, whereas Cinderella stretches back much further than that as a whole version minus the name of Cinderella, which we'll get to in a second. The oldest version of a Cinderella type story that I could find was from Egypt, and that is actually based on a real person called Rhodopis. Now, Rhodopis existed several hundred years before the tale of her emerged, which was in 100 AD BC. Um, the lines on that are quite blurred. That's when her story was written down, not when she lived. And then that fairy tale or fairy tale version of her life was then popularised in the 19th century. Rhodopis was someone who knew lots of people whose names you're gonna know, so Herodotus wrote about her several hundred years previously to when her fictionalised version of her life was written down. He wrote about her, he said that um, she was a Greek slave who had a love affair with Aesop, um, and then she was sold to various people, ended up in Egypt and was freed by Sappho's brother, and it's rumoured that she then went on and married the king of Egypt. Fact and fiction get blurred quite a lot with regard to Rhodophis, but the story of her that came out several hundred years after Herodotus had first written about her was that she was um, a courtesan. Some people write about her um, as a slave, some people write about her as a courtesan. Some people um, don't explicitly write that she um, was a prostitute, but say that she had um, hands that did wicked things and a mouth that did wicked things, heavily implying that she was made to do things with her body that she didn't want to do. So the basic story goes that Rhodopis was bathing by the river Nile, um, she had her clothes and some shoes that her owner had given to her on the um, bank of the river, a falcon comes and steals one of those sandals, takes it to the pharaoh, the pharaoh then sees this shoe and thinks I must marry the woman who owns this teeny tiny shoe, small feet are things that are going to come into this discussion and we're going to get more into that in a second. Um, dainty is the word. This woman who has very, very dainty feet and he must marry her. So he conducts a nationwide search to find the woman who owns this shoe, finds Rhodopis, and they get married. So that is the first version of Cinderella. Well, not Cinderella. Cinderella is a version of Rhodopis. You know what I mean? Of the Cinderella type story that we have in history. We move further and we find another version, this time in China. This is the fairy tale of Ye Shen, and this is thought to have been written down about 800 AD. This tells the story of a cave chief called Wu who married two women who each gave birth to one girl. Wu then dies as does one of the mothers. The remaining mother is left to bring up her child and the other woman's daughter who she decides she does not like and this is Ye Shen. Ye Shen doesn't have any friends of her own apart from one who happens to be a fish and she goes to visit, a visit, a visit, a visit, a visit, she goes to visit this fish there we go, every day at the river and talks to the fish and feeds it some food that she has. She doesn't have much food at all, um, but she gives a little of what she does have to this fish. Um, the stepmother finds out that Ye Shen is doing this and is really angry because the fish is food and she's keeping it from the family. So one day she follows her, after Ye Shen leaves, she kills the fish, she cooks it, she eats it. Ye Shen is distraught. So um, she goes to bed crying in her dreams. She hears this voice from a wise man who tells her to collect the bones from the fire of the fish, keep them safe and use them to wish on. So that's what she does. Ye Shen's stepmother and her um, half-sister find out that there's gonna be a festival in town. It's a festival where people go every year to go and meet single people to try and get married. Obviously they refuse to let Ye Shen go she has to stay at home and they go off and have a great time. Ye Shen goes to the fish bones, she wishes on them, she says, I really wish that I could go to this ball, could you please give me some kind 
of clothes so that I can go. They give her a turquoise robe with kingfisher feather cloak, very snazzy, and some tiny gold slippers. Now this is in the days before um, the foot binding in China, but there is an obsession still here with small, small feet. She is told explicitly not to lose these clothes because if she does, the bones will stop working. She will get no more wishes. So Yeshen goes off to this festival and when she's there, she's having a great time, but she sees her stepmother and her stepmother recognizes her and starts to follow her. So she runs away and in doing so, loses a slipper, guys. Did you see that one coming? No, 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 no. So once Yesheng gets home, she wishes on the bones that she could have the slipper back, but obviously the bones don't work. She had been told not to lose them, and she did. Careless. Meanwhile, the shoe has been found by a merchant who then takes it to the king. The king is amazed by this tiny, tiny shoe and how delicate it looks. So he decides to put it on display with a sign saying, Whoever is the wearer of this shoe, please come forward because I want to marry you. It's a bit, it's a bit foot fetishy, Cinderella, isn't it? Maybe that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> yeah, Shen wants the bones to work again and she has heard that this shoe is on display, so she goes to steal it back. She gets caught, she gets arrested, she gets dragged in front of the king who is furious with her and she has to say, hang on a second, that shoe, it's mine, no big deal. And he gets all excited and says, I have to marry you. She says, okay, thank you very much. And her stepmother and half sister are somehow crushed to death by a shower of falling stones in their cave. And then they are buried in the tomb of regretful women. The end. Jumping forward quite far, there were quite a few that I could talk about, but I'm picking out the key ones that I want to talk to you about today, the ones that I think are most interesting. This one was written in 1634 in Italy uh, by Giambattista Basile, who I've mentioned on this channel before. This is called The Cat Cinderella, which is not about a cat called Cinderella, which I thought was going to be the case, and it, it wasn't, and it was all very sad. But however, it is about a girl called Zizola, who I keep calling Zoella because what is a modern day fairy tale if not a YouTube fairy tale of Alfie and Zoe, apart from them being actual human beings, obviously. So apologies, oh, I accidentally call her Zoella through this. It's not through othering of the Italian language. It's simply because it's a connection I couldn't help make. So, Zizola. <laughs> She is a young Italian girl in 1634. I don't know why I'm saying in 1634, she's not a real life person. She was written about in 1634. Zizola lives very happily with her mother and her father and then one day her mother dies and her dad marries this awful excuse for a human being who is her terrible, terrible stepmother. Now, Zizola, instead of putting up with this shit, like a lot of people in fairy tales, thought, I know how this story goes and I don't want an evil stepmother. Her teacher, who was teaching her things, which is very progressive, guys, teaching women, uh, who was teaching her things, taught her a very shrewd lesson that day. She said, you know, so not Zoella, you know, Zizola, if you would like to take control of your life, I suggest that you kill your stepmother. So Zizola said, okay and did. So she murdered her stepmother and then persuaded her father to marry her teacher because she thought that would be a great idea. <laughs> Plot twist. Turns out her teacher is even worse than the stepmother that she so callously killed. A mastermind, an absolute mastermind. So, now Zizel is in this position where she is completely ignored. Her teacher, who has married her dad, has suddenly moved her six daughters into the house, um, which is no fun for anybody, and she gets completely, completely ignored. Her dad is besotted with his new wife. So her dad goes away on business quite a lot. He always brings back presents for his six daughters. This time he says to Zizola, would you like a present? I'm going away. And she says, no, I don't need your present. But actually, if you do see a fairy, I would really like a present from them. This present is a date tree, which she plants in her back garden. It grows to the size of a woman and a fairy comes out of it and says, would you like a wish? Now she would like a wish because, plot point, there is a ball and everyone is invited apart from her. She's not allowed to go because she's told to stay at home and clean. She is called the nickname of Cat Cinderella, by the way, by her sisters, which is why the title is called this. Um, so yes, she says, I would like some um, 
beautiful things to wear please so that I can go to this ball they say okay and she goes to this ball but it's not just one ball here we have um, that trope that you find in fairy tales of things coming in threes so at the first ball the king spots her and tries to chase after her well actually he's too lazy to chase after her he sends his messenger to chase after her um, so uh, Zizola throws some coins behind her to distract the messenger who stops to pick them up and the king is very annoyed about this in fact he says you have thrown away my pleasure for some shitty coins. The second time, the same thing happens and she throws some pearls behind to distract the messenger who picks them up. The king is very annoyed this time too and says, by the soul of my ancestors, if you don't find this maiden, I'll give you a sound beating and I'll give you as many kicks in your ass as you have hairs on your head. I told you he was not amused. So on the third time that she goes to a ball, there's a lot of balls going on in this town, the third time she leaves her slipper behind. The king finds it. He goes on a search to find the person who has the slipper. She gets to leave all of her sisters behind and start a new life, the end. Now we move on to the tale that you probably know most and this is Cinderella by Charles Perrault and this was written in 1697 and it begins as this. Once upon a time there was a gentleman who took the haughtiest and proudest woman in the world for his second wife. She had two daughters with the same temperament and the exact same appearance. On the other hand, the husband had a daughter whose gentleness and goodness was without parallel. She got this from her mother, who was the best person in the world. So there we go, putting her high up on a pedestal there. Cinderella is called Cinder Tail by her um, sisters because she's always sitting in ash because she's sweeping the fireplace all the time, um, which is where the name comes from there. And it is the tale that we know from Disney. She gets a fairy godmother, she gets a pumpkin, she gets um, mice turning into footmen for her. And at the end of this, when Cinderella has dropped her slipper and she is found by the prince, she forgives her family for the way that they have treated her. And she's an all round, very good person. How dull. So then we move on to the same year actually and still in France and um, this is by a female folklorist who I'm going to talk about more in um, more episodes of Fairy Tales with Jen and that is Marie Catherine de Launay and as I said this was penned in exactly the same year so these tales were being told around the same time and this one is much much longer and it is a mishmash of Cinderella and Hansel and Gretel, which is rather interesting. To summarise this one, it is about a failed king and queen who have lost all of their money and they have three children, the youngest of which is called Finette, and she is lovely, the other two are awful, um, and they decide that they can't afford to feed their children anymore, so they're gonna go out into woods and leave them there. Do you know the story? I think you know the story. Um, Cinderella, sorry, Finette, Finette hears about this um, and she goes to visit her godmother who lives far away. She takes her a gift of ingredients to make a cake and says, how do I get out of this situation? So she says, what you must do is you must tie a rope to your mother um, as she walks away. I don't know how she wouldn't notice that you were doing this, but you should tie some thread or rope to her so that you can follow this thread back to your house. So that's what they do, even though she thinks maybe she shouldn't take these two sisters with her because they're treating her awfully, like they physically beat her. She's always covered in bruises, but she decides to take them home too. So on the first attempt that they try and lose these children, they find their way back. This happens again and she leaves a trail of ash behind her, cinders, and they follow it back to the house. The third try, their mother is having none of this. She doesn't leave them in a forest, she leaves them in a desert. And they have left a trail of peas behind them to find their way home. But the peas have been eaten, so they can no longer find their way home. But what they do find is an acorn which they decide to plant. And they dance around it and they will it to grow into a huge tree so that they can climb it and try and see further out into the desert to work out where they need to go to. So they climb this tree and they see this huge, huge, castle. It has walls made out of emeralds and rubies and it has a roof of diamonds and then they go, all three of them, to this castle. But, plot twist, this castle turns out to be an ogre's castle. The ogre's wife opens the door, she's 15 feet tall, she has one eye which is in the middle of her skull which is six feet wide and she sees these children and she thinks, I'm gonna keep you for myself. My husband normally goes out and collects children. We have a room full of them ready to be eaten, but I'm going to keep the three of you for me. So she brings the children inside. The ogre can smell them um, and 
First she denies that there's no new children in the house, but then she has to admit that there are some new children and actually what they're there to do is to do housework. Finette is very used to doing housework because that was what she was made to do at home. The other two, not so much, but they start by cooking and by cleaning and they call the yoga over and they say, is this oven hot enough for you? Again, Hansel and Gretel, the ogre peers in, they push him inside, he burns to a crisp. So then his wife comes in. She isn't that upset that her husband has just been burnt to a crisp. And the three children, they say, I know, will make you look beautiful. Um, I'm using these not because she is an ogre, but because pretty and beautiful mean goodness and normally in fairy tales which again is a discussion for another time they say we're going to make you beautiful and um so they start combing her hair and while they're combing her hair they slit her throat and decapitate her so after that brutal interlude they decide that they're going to steal Finette doesn't decide this the other two decide that they're going to steal all of the ogre's things and the jewels and they're going to go to this castle far away that they suddenly remembered exists and they're gonna to go to a ball there. Uh, Finette can't go because she doesn't have any of these things, but once they have gone, she discovers this secret stash of beautiful things which she puts on. I don't know why they fit her, considering the ogre was 15 feet tall. We glaze over that. So she puts on these things, she goes to the ball, she loses her slipper, the king tries to find the person who owns the slipper, he finds the person who owns the slipper and they get married. This Cinderella, again, is a very, very forgiving one, even though her sisters beat her all the time, even though her parents try to throw her out into the wild and apparently didn't give a shit. She forgives everyone and everyone ends up living in a nice house all together. They live happily ever after the end, how dull. I'm not saying that they should be killed, but you know, maybe they shouldn't all live in the same house. Anyway, moving on to the Brothers Grimm tale, which was in the early 1800s, um, and this one does have a rather gruesome ending. This is about a woman called Cinderella who was abused by her stepmother and her stepsisters. Um, she grows a magical tree in her garden. I think it's a maple tree that has the spirit of her mother um, and gives her gifts of beautiful dresses so that she can go to the ball that the king is putting on because he wants to find um, a bride for his son. So she uh, leaves her slipper there when she goes there obviously and then the prince comes around trying to find the woman who owns this shoe and when they come to the house they hide Cinderella away but the two sisters decide that they're going to try on these shoes, these slippers. Their mother says you're not going to fit into these so you must cut off parts of your feet. So one of the sisters cuts off all her toes that, so that she can try and fit into the shoe. And she does, and the prince is amazed and thinking, you're my bride. And then he notices that she's bleeding all over the floor and it's like, you trickster, how dare you? The other sister comes forward, does the same trick, except this time she cuts off her heel. Different. Puts her foot into the slipper, it fits. The prince falls for it again, he's not that bright. Says, oh my God, my bride, how excellent. Then notices that she's bleeding all over the floor. To be honest though, would you think that that's a trick that someone would do? Maybe he's not that silly. Maybe he just didn't think that people would go to that length, but apparently they do. So he throws his sister to the side, but then Cinderella steps forward and says, actually, yeah, that shoe is mine and I don't have to cut off anything to fit into that shoe. He is overjoyed, Cinderella puts on the shoe and they ride into the sunset and it's the icing on the cake at the wedding where the sisters are hobbling around with their mashed up feet, the prince's doves come down and peck out their eyeballs. The end. So there we go, that is the history of Cinderella. Two books that I wanted to show you today that are based on Cinderella is this one here, which is actually non-fiction. There's a version called Chinese Cinderella, which I think is quite popular, and a lot of people read that at school. I never read that one at school, but that is um, a child version of this book here, which is for adults. So this is about a girl called Adeline Yen Ma, and it's about her childhood during the Civil War in China when she was an unwanted daughter. It's very, very harrowing, and she suffered a lot of abuse. But um, yes, this is referred to as the Chinese Cinderella, even though that was also an ancient Chinese Cinderella, as we found out today. And another one that I want to talk to you about is this really fun picture book that's published by Abrams and Chronicle, and it's called Interstellar Cinderella. I see what you did there. And who's it by? It is by Deborah Underwood and is illustrated by Meg Hunt. And this is about Cinderella, who is a mechanic. She wants to be a mechanic. She loves to fix things. Her family are awful to her. They won't let her go to the space ball. Um, but she manages to get a rocket that she fixes and goes to the ball. But she leaves behind her wrench. <laughs> and the prince goes everywhere trying to find the person who owns this wrench and trying to get people to fix his spaceship with the wrench to see if they know how to use it and her stepmother can't use it and neither can her sisters but then she steps forward and she can use it um, and the prince says to her, I have to read you this bit because it's just great 
She landed right beside the prince. That wrench is mine, she cried. She quickly fixed the ailing ship. The prince said, be my bride. She thought this over carefully. Her family watched in panic. I'm far too young for marriage, but I'll be your chief mechanic. So she becomes the royal mechanic and she loves her job and all is well with the world. So there we go, that's the end of this month's episode of Fairy Tales with Jen. I hope that you guys have enjoyed it. Please leave me a comment in the description box down below. If you would like to support what I do on this channel, you can always do so by purchasing one of my books, which are always linked in the description box, or purchase a download of one of the podcasts which I do, which I'll also link in the description box down below. I hope that you guys are having a great week, and I'll speak to you very soon. Lots of books, love. Bye.